this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Hi listeners, this is Brent Sutton. Welcome to the 44th episode of the Practice of Learning Teams, the podcast show. I feel very blessed in my journey of the new view of safety, authoring the book with my colleagues Glynis McCarthy and Brent Robinson, and hosting this podcast series has allowed me to meet a wide range of group of people who are all striving to make safety better. It was two years ago last week that I last got together in person with Todd Conklin, where we hatched the crazy idea of writing a how-to book about learning teams. And it'll be one year in August since the book and this podcast was launched. Whilst the pandemic has prevented get-togethers, I've been able to meet many other new people and their journeys using Zoom and Microsoft Teams. On today's show, we are delighted to have Rosa Antonia Carrillo join us on the podcast. I call Rosa the First Lady of Safety Leadership. Her book, The Relationship Factor in Safety Leadership, is a great reminder about the need to humanize safety and the core eight beliefs about human nature that are common to leaders who successfully communicate that safety is important whilst meeting business results. Using stories and business language, the book explains how to create and recover important stakeholder relationships by setting priorities and taking actions based on these beliefs. In this two-part series, Glynis McCarthy and myself talk with Rosa and her cats about her journey so far and the value of engagement and communication. Please sit back and enjoy as we explore the journey of the First Lady of Safety Leadership. And I'm here with um, with Glynis, and it's great that uh, Glynis has been able to join me today. And of course, Rosa, we, we've um, sort of spoke with you a couple of times now through some other different mediums, and I really enjoyed that that wonderful chat we had on the Wasafopedia on Meet the Authors. And and I recall it was about 3 a.m. in the morning for us, and <laughs> it, it was morning for you guys. But I really enjoyed uh, your views and, and your comments, so I thought it was a great opportunity to get you to come on the podcast today and just share with us a little bit your journey and about how, how you, sort of your view around the new view and, and in particular around learning teams about that whole concept about you know being curious and engaging with people yes wonderful well I, yes I, and I enjoyed that session as well with uh, Safopedia I, I do believe that having a sense of humor is absolutely essential uh, to being a good communicator <laughs> <laughs> so I enjoyed that aspect of our exchange. Excellent. And for our listeners today, just to let you know that Rosa will also be joined by by the occasional cat that comes in and participates in the podcast. So oh, we're, yes. We're all set up for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now they're a bit traumatized because of, uh, as I told you earlier, I was having these uh, uh, emergencies and they do not like uh, emergencies. <laughs> So ah. they may not come out, but that's okay. Right. So, so they don't handle variability well. They like to have a, a nice, steady, steady thing going on. Yeah, like, like, like unlike the rest of us. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So it's probably how, what organizations want. They don't want any change. They just want life yeah, to no carry change, on. You know, the, no, the toilet no. gets plugged up. I mean, you know, let's pretend it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I look, I look forward to them participating at some point on today's okay, show. Great, great. Mm-hmm. So, um, shall we start off by saying that um, t- today, a, a lot of the new view is, is being driven by uh, uh, research and around the academic view. And what are your thoughts about how do we shift it from that narrative of sort of academics down to the how-to? or the sort of the practical elements of it. What are your thoughts around that? Well, I've always seen myself in that role 
uh, if you go back to even as early as, as the 90s when I was writing, I, I was taking the academic research and translating it so that um, not only managers and supervisors could understand it, but uh, also employees. And, and what I found was that employees actually get it a lot faster than managers do because they don't have that ego need to protect themselves or to have all the answers. They, they just kind of dig into it uh, and begin to explore it and start to develop solutions. So I, I always have enjoyed working at the grassroots level. The uh, next level is, of course, the supervisor level. I, I've done so many interviews, probably thousands of interviews and focus groups over the last 25 years so that I, I have a really deep understanding of the challenges and the feelings and the thoughts that the reactions that people have to the various safety initiatives. The, the primary one being that, um, uh, you know, yet another initiative, yet another program. Uh, and none of them really work uh, to our satisfaction. And every once in a while you get one that does. But it isn't because of the program. I find it's because of the individuals involved uh, and particularly leadership. I, I believe in leadership. I, so many people are trying to get rid of that and say, well, everyone in the organization is a leader. I don't believe that because we are human beings and we have always had that role at the center. When we were around the campfire, when we were in caves, we had leaders. Why? Because they're the ones that bring people together uh, and to try and understand what's going on around them. Otherwise, they wouldn't become leaders. Unfortunately, now in our organizations, don't, don't play that role. They are managers. So I have been saying leadership is a choice and the primary role of leadership is to go uh, uh, talk with people make people feel included, be inclusive, and find out where the discussions and the conversations need to take place. What is it that people aren't clear about? And, and stop getting all upset because, oh, I sent out a, a memo or I, I, I had this video and I explained it all and, and, and people don't get it. They, they just don't get it. So, uh, but that's not the way people learn. Uh, or grow, they, they do it through relationship and conversation. So I see that I am trying to simplify all of that complicated science and research into what about culture and say, okay, what does it boil down to? It boils down to the quality of relationships and the way we interact with each other in the workplace. That's, that's, that's what drives what happens in the workplace. It drives what happens in our families as well. So that's where I'm at in terms of turning the academic research into a practical application that makes sense to the people doing the work. So we think about it, I mean, you know, workers have a voice. Yes. Is it that we're impeding them from using their voice? Are we just not Nobody listening? wants to use their voice when no one is listening. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you listen, you let out an avalanche of, of opinions and comments. Um, I don't know if you've ever um, read uh, or heard of AES. It, it's a power company um, that was started by, by David Locke. Uh, and one of the things that he did, I mean, it went from zero to eight billion overnight. And one of the things that he did was that when he did a survey, he answered every single question on the survey himself. As a result of that, he was able to find out what's, what was going on in the organization. And everybody at AES had a credit card to buy whatever they needed without consulting with anyone else. One worker 
bought the wrong product and he spent a million dollars on it. And uh, David, learning, that's a learning opportunity. What, what are we going to learn from it? He didn't have HR, he didn't have EHS. He had a, an organization where people communicated and trusted each other to the extent that they were able to resolve issues as they came up. And the company grew and prospered until 2008 when the market crashed uh, and he got fired because the price of the stock went down. His board forgot that his method was the one that had gotten them to the eight billion. They fired him because they they made him, they blamed him for the drop in the stock market price. And, and that's what happens to so many great experiments. Just the history is replete with them. Great experiments come to an end because of external circumstances uh, that make it look like it's failed and they don't give it time to recover. It is very unique, isn't it? Where you have such a high trust model um, in order for, to, for you to have a high trust model that works it is about having a degree of parity and having a workforce that are empowered to have that voice. Um, I would argue that many of our diverse workforces that, that we work alongside actually have never really been given the empowerment to use that voice in a way that really directs change. Um, I really like your comment about leaders. I agree with you that leaders, you're a leader from within and the title that is assigned to you may or may not contain leadership but if we're going to make transformational change we have to identify the leaders within our workforce and we need to empower them so that they can empower their teams yes absolutely and my point about um, when you begin to respond to people's ideas comments and concerns the floodgates open up and you begin to get all kinds of ideas to improve uh, you know, effectiveness, improve products, innovation. Uh, and because if you're sitting back wondering why you, know, you don't have any <laughs> engagement or any innovation going on in your organization, it, it usually goes back to lack of response. Lack of response and, and uh, unconscious bias, because I, I believe in the basic goodwill of people, okay? I'm not gonna say, oh, managers are terrible people. No, uh, we have an unconscious bias about who has valuable information. And, and that's how I feel. I wrote it that when that article was published, I said, wow, I, I'm being heard, I feel, for the first time. And it's been 25 years. So if we um, sort of explore that further, um, um, one, one of the things about, about learning tips, tips is this uh, notion of, you know, engaging with different workers, um, understanding those different views. And some of the things that we've seen from organizations is they start to say to us, we're getting too much learning. Say that again? Yeah, that they're getting too much learning because every time they go out, they learn something. So they. Uh, they get this, uh, I think, thing in their head that, that the more often they go out, the more they learn. It must be because, you know, um, we've got limited resources, we've got limited, um, you know, methods or ways of doing it. And that if we keep doing this, we're just going to keep finding more and more and more and more things to try and um, fix or solve. When in actual fact, I sort of really asked the question, should we engage in just to listen and understand? That is our job to fix stuff or is our job to support workers to actually improve? That's a really good point because one of the reasons when I talk to safety professionals or middle managers uh, and I say, you know, you ought to go out and just chat with people and say, hey, you know, do you have everything you need for your job or, you know, what's going on? How are you doing this? How can I help you? They'll say, oh, no, because then they'll ask me for a thousand dollar ergonomic check and I can't afford to give everyone a $1,000 ergonomic chair. 
<laughs> That's literally what, what one group said to me. Um, so I said, well, what if you went out and chatted and didn't feel responsible for providing everything that you were asked for? How would that change your feelings? How would that change the conversation? Do you think you, you would, that people would be capable of understanding? Okay, well, I understand, but I think we're going to have to work on a way to maybe get a less expensive product because, you know, we're really struggling in this area or that area uh, and inviting them, inviting them to come up with a solution rather than training them to just ask for stuff that you don't deliver and creating a negative uh, environment, environment of mistrust. Absolutely. And I think um, one of the things that Learning Teams does is because it puts so much focus on understanding the nature of the problem rather than trying to fix it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we really get to um, look at that context. And what I find personally find that workers are able to self-resolve lots of things because ultimately workers are looking to resolve things within their own domain, their own construct. Yeah. They're not looking at it from an organizational point of view. They're looking at it within, within their own boundary, their team, you know, themselves, their work colleague. Yeah. So seldom are they going to come up with and say, I need $10,000 for this beautiful ergonomic chair. They might say, we need to raise the bench so far so my arms don't get so tired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you, you start getting some very creative ideas because, I mean, workers are doing that all the time. You just don't know about it because they know oh, they where all the blocks in the system are and they have to go around those blocks. So uh, we're very creative species, very adaptable. Which, which is interesting because um, when workers are creative, and it doesn't go wrong, we call it innovation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. When they're creative and it goes wrong, we basically say that they violated and committed unsafe acts. Yes, exactly. And that's uh, the story I was telling about AES, that's where they were so different because a mistake was made and they didn't then go out and say, okay, the business credit card is canceled. And I think there's a real difference, isn't there, when if you're going out to work alongside your workforce, so mm -hmm. you're inquiring about how do they do their jobs, you know, uh, where are the things that are causing them to compromise versus the general question of what do you need? Um, they are just so different on that spectrum, aren't they? I think that if you if you just ask people, you know, what do you need? And of course, people are going to be aspirational in those needs and wants. But actually, if you go along and have genuine conversations where you're looking to pull together your expertise, the expertise of your workers in terms of how work is being done, your expertise in terms of leading the, the organization um, in, in terms of your role, actually there you have a partnership. And then you can start to talk about what are the things that are impeding good practice. And I think you're less likely at that point to get those kind of outlandish, but well, we need this and that costs, you know, $10,000 or $20,000. This is now about how do we um, actually manage the day-to-day -day activities of getting our jobs done. And the other thing that um, also happens because we have uh, employee teams, if you give them the budget, if you say to them, you guys are in charge of the maintenance budget, or you guys are in charge of the expenditures for the ergonomic budget. So, have you ever seen that? Where they, they actually find less expensive ways to take care of problems than, than management had anticipated? Yeah, to, to us it's normal. Um, and we, and we, when we wrote the, the, uh, the book, The Practice of Learning Teams, we um, sit, call this thing called the 531 model. Mm -hmm. And that um, when we're in a learning team, um, we're looking for you know uh, workers to try and self-resolve five things. Um, there are three things that might require both the work of the organization to do, and there might be one thing that the organization has to do. Because the things the organization has to do is, is driven by time, money, or resource things that the workers are doing is stuff that they can build within their own um, domain and constraint. And it's and it's really interesting that that actually just happens naturally by itself. 
Mm-hmm. And then what we talk about doing with organizations is we, we get the workers to go back and then say, did it work as intended? Yeah. And, and if it didn't, then we either improve it or remove it. Don't allow it to build up to create redundancy or to create waste or to create other barriers. And I sometimes wonder if we're scared of experimenting. Well, uh, maybe managers are, but they probably have a good reason for it. I had just had an interesting experience where I, I, I was doing a focus group and somehow a manager had been put in with craft people and that's not usually the way you want to focus group, right? So he brought it up and I said, oh, that he was a manager. And I said, oh, okay, um, then why don't, you know, would you like to leave? I, it might be best for you to do that. And he said, no, no, I'm all right if everybody else is all right. And of course, everybody else said, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And at that point, I feel I should have said, no, it's best if you leave. But I didn't because I thought, well, maybe there's a different level of trust here and, and I should go with what the group is telling me. But that wasn't the case. The case was that the manager was afraid to leave because he had been assigned to the focus group. Uh, And I'm always getting an an aha at a different level at just how powerful uh, the corporate expectations are and the limitations that they place on people. To me, the idea of not feeling free to leave a focus group if I felt I was going to interfere with the open communication is a no-brainer. So it's hard to then think, but but I but that is exactly what we're contending with is that the managers uh, and supervisors are not free to, they do not, many of them do not feel free to do anything outside of the corporate guidelines. Have you found that to be true? Uh, look, I, I, I think there are definitely issues with maturity from an organizational point of view. I, I think mm-hmm. there's also different levels of the individual's own maturity as well. Um, you know, s- seldom do we, uh, I, I see quite often, seldom do we support people in those management roles to understand what good management looks like or mm-hmm. how to uh, coach and mentor them and you know they get hired because of their experiences mm-hmm. rather than their actual capabilities uh, and, and I, I see it constantly with supervisors their uh, people skills and then we also train them out of that like if they do have any inclinations they they get punished or you know, not rewarded for for going in that direction yeah the good ones leave they say well <laughs> that's enough I'm going somewhere else so so you're actually pushing out your best talent uh, because the one one of the things that people value the most is autonomy it, it's one of the biggest satisfiers right? so what what do you see the future this whole sort of the you know the new view of safety um, you know better engagement how do you see that sort of on developing from your perspective okay well I have felt, and I, and I think some folks are doing something different, like Ron Gant, because he's a very hands-on, you know, working with crews and and, and working with the groups. But for um, for the most part, I feel that the new safety view is very academic and doesn't really get into how do we apply this on, at at a practical level. How would we um, uh, create this organizational wide. I mean, because right now it exists in small enclaves, right? Which is the same for any high performance teams. For the most part, it depends on the individual leader and and, and the people that he has attract he or she have attracted into that group. So we uh, we have a lot of work to do in terms of how um, how do we create what what is the language that we need to be using in order for people not to feel excluded Th- this whole thing with um, 
new you versus old you and people you know making fun of each other like if you're old you you're um you're a caveman and if you're a new view, you're you're just arrogant and, and don't appreciate anything that's gone before you. Uh, that that comes from um, lack of common language, lack of common understanding. And I don't think that the I don't think that it is the the academics' responsibility uh, to to make that uh, to do. Uh, make that connection, that bridge. I think it's more people like you and myself and Glennis who um, are interested in those academic concepts and like to think about uh, put ourselves in, in, in an empathetic place with the workers and think about how uh, this could be translated into language that, that would be helpful and useful. Um, I very much agree with you, Rosa. I think that um, health and safety in general is something that is quite exclusive. I find when I work with workers, they'll often say to me, oh, health and safety belongs to that person. Maybe they are the worker representative. Maybe it is the manager. But actually, they see health and safety often as belonging to something outside of their domain and outside of their agency. I agree with you that in order for people to be able to grab hold of whether it be safety too or safety differently or how we do safety in our organizations, what we have to do is develop a common understanding of language and a common understanding of the concepts that support that language so that people are able to buy into conversations so that they know what those words mean at an inherent level and that they are able to use those words with some fluidity so that again, you have transparency and when you have transparency and a lack of agenda, you have trust. And once we move to a trust model, then actually we can work in partnership. But unless we have all of those things in place, it is very difficult for us to move into a trust model. And I think that's why we constantly see our frontline supervisors and or our managers often as the gatekeepers when it comes to health and safety. And so, you know, the example that you gave of a manager coming into your focus group, you know, some, I, what I find often is that managers are worried or fearful of what their workers might say and how that might reflect on them. And then where does that place that manager or supervisor within the hierarchy of the organisation? listeners for being part of this podcast. We would love to hear your learnings or other topics you would like us to explore about learning teams. Go to www.podcastlearnings.com and give us your feedback. Become part of the community of practice with learning teams. Go to www.learningteamscommunity.com. Support the authors of the practice of learning teams. Purchase the book from Amazon.com or go to www.learningteamsbook.com for an inside look and other free book resources from the authors. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.